we're just at the beginning of part three of this course on moral psychology, where we're looking at whether discoveries in moral psychology could undermine or support ethical claims. What we've done so far is to consider Foote's method of trolley cases and Cam's approach to the question of whether distance is ethically significant. In both of those cases, I've suggested that the ethical arguments just are continuous and draw on claims about human moral psychology. Notably, both Foote and Cam are explicit in making claims about and relying on claims about why it is that humans make certain patterns of judgments. So there's a natural role there for moral psychology to dive in and support or undermine those claims as we've seen. Now, I think this is very important. So if you've read the philosophical literature on this topic about moral psychology's relevance for ethics, you'll see that a lot of that literature focuses on relatively abstract cases of debunking arguments and arguments which are quite far removed from the details of ethical arguments for particular cases. So my suggestion here is this, that we can more clearly see that there might be a role for discoveries in moral psychology and allowing us to support or undermine ethical principles. If we look at particular ethical arguments, that might be more fruitful than looking at things in a very broad scale. However, I think we can also say we've only reached a conditional condition. No, a conditional conclusion. You recall that Kant said that empirical claims have no place in ethics. They're inimical to the integrity of ethics as the upholder of moral principles. Oh, very bad. Um, what we've seen is that, you know, if Foote's method is broadly okay, or if Cam's method is broadly okay, then Kant was wrong. But those are not the only options on the table, of course. So we also saw that Thompson has another method of trolley cases. And when we look at Thompson's method, we don't find that there's any obvious or straightforward connection for discoveries in moral psychology. Nor, when we looked at arguments from framing effects due to Rini and Sinner Armstrong, did we find, I think, a convincing argument that discoveries in moral psychology could undermine Foote's arguments by showing that her premises, which seem to rely on non-inferentially justified claims about particular moral scenarios, must be things that we can't know. I don't think that the argument succeeded in showing that. Uh, so it might be that if you're, more, if you're more inclined to think that Thompson has got things sorted, her approach is actually the right one and somehow something fundamentally mistaken with foot or Cam, at least I've interpret, as I've interpreted them, then you might actually think that Kant was right. But I want to emphasize that we're just at the beginning of thinking about this topic. We haven't thought very deeply yet about the processes that underpin moral judgments in humans. It might be that when we think more deeply about those processes, we're going to reach a different picture. Indeed, in the next lecture, I will present to you an argument for quite a different conclusion. The argument I'll present to you is supposed to establish, first of all, that discoveries in moral psychology are in no way relevant to undermining or supporting ethical conclusions any more than they are to undermining or supporting conclusions in physics or in mathematics. So that's the first thing I'll try to argue for. And the second thing I'll try to argue for is that discoveries in moral psychology are though relevant in showing us that some ways of doing ethics are fundamentally misguided, including Thompson's method and other methods that rely on non-inferentially justified judgments being candidates for knowledge. So all of that's still to come. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture this week. I look forward to seeing you for the live session on Thursday.